Hello, everyone. Welcome to our eighth webinar alumni series today. And our topic is leadership lessons. We wanna thank you right now for joining us today. We're gonna to have some fun. Uh, I am your panel moderator and host, uh, Jill Horowitz, the alumni engagement officer here at Broward College. Very excited to be here and have you meet these three wonderful people that I've had the pleasure to get to know. A uh, few housekeeping rules. Uh, we have the Q&A panel, which you can use. We also have enabled the chat. We wanna make this as interactive as possible. We've got polling questions for you, which I think is why our audience continues to stay engaged. It's really, really cool, even though we're not seeing all of you, to be able to have some responses uh, and see what everybody else is thinking. We always get surprised with the polls. And um, last but not least, our presentation is being recorded. So it's on our website as well. We'll send you the link. And if you do want to go back and watch some of these really great points that you're going to learn about, we encourage you to do so. A little bit about our alumni program, our commercial for, we have over a million alumni for our college, which is really great. As you know, we've had to pivot our events, which used to be in person. Now we have all of our events as webinars. Hopefully soon someday we'll be getting back to our in-person events. But as you can see on your screen, when you log on to the Broward College website, we have six different boxes of things that you can click on to see that our events are happening, what volunteer opportunities that we do have, which are virtual. Uh, we have over 150 alumni spotlights there, a bunch of benefits for you. I'll give a quick plug for GEICO. They've been giving our people unbelievable rates. Uh, our newsletters, website recordings, and our distinguished alumni are listed there. So I'm excited for the first part to introduce you to our panelists. Uh, so for the first one, Dorika Carter. So I didn't find Dorika. Dorika found me and I really thought, you know what, she is really a leader because she went out of her way to want to share her certified John Maxwell training with all of you, our esteemed alumni and also the friends of, Dor of Broward College. So thank you for joining us, Dorika, today. She leads these mastermind group sessions, personal coaching. She's a keynote speaker. And she did get her associate's degree here, went on and got her bachelor's at FIU in international relations. And as we move on to Dr. Wynn, Dr. Wynn has been at Broward College six years, but we congratulate him. He most recently took a position as Dean of Academic Affairs at South University in Palm Beach, but is still at Broward doing some adjunct classes. Um, and he's got a lot of notable accomplishments, but I do wanna share some of his degrees, which are extremely impressive. He does have his bachelor's from UC Santa Barbara. He then earned a JD degree from the U, University of Miami, and his uh, PhD from FAU. So we're gonna look forward to a lot of great insight from Dr. Wynn. And then of course, last but not least, Professor Jones, who I've had the distinguished honor of being on some of her panels and getting to know her. And she's an adjunct here at Broward for seven years. And I would, if there's a waiting list or a long line for her classes, that would be her. Um, and she also has her own practice, um, which is called the Center for Change and Growth, which is in Coral Springs. And uh, among other things that she's done, she's worked in addiction treatment centers, eating disorder centers, and you know she has her master's from NOVA. So, I'm very excited. I think all three panelists are gonna give us different spins on the same topic and hopefully we'll learn a lot. So without further ado, this is the order we're going in. I'm gonna introduce Dorika Carter and you could take it from here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jill. I really super excited for that introduction and I'm excited to be here. Nice again to connect with all of you and the panelists and of course, Jill told you a little bit about me, um, but just a tidbit more. Why I decided to be a part of this is because I was a part of Broad College and I, I, I was very much um, lucky or blessed to have the opportunity to go to that college, that allowed me to go to FIU and continued my education. Plus, I love what I do with John Maxwell and that's why I do it now as a part of my everyday thing. So moving on. 
Now, the first polling question, and this is what I want to ask you guys, and feel free to have fun with this, take your time. Now, who or what would you say influences your opinion the most? Who or what would you say? News, religion, friends, family, or colleagues? I want to know. Okay. All right, I think everybody answered or that should be enough time for them. We've still got two more people going. Okay. Okay, thank All you. All right. There we go. I, I wanna see, so. Wow, so we have 26% say the news, 11% says religion, 19% says friends, 37%, wow, family, and 7% says colleagues. Thank you guys. So we see from this uh, majority of us, we get our um, influences from friends and family, and that's how we socialize. Now it takes me into what I wanna talk about. Now this is John Maxwell's number eight law. And this comes from his 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. This book has sold millions of copies all over the world and it's translated into multiple languages. Most corporations use this to train their senior executive and their leaders. Now there are 21, but I'm just gonna touch on one and that's the law of intuition because I feel that like this will be a great um, way for us to understand how we can use intuition as leaders to better ourselves and to grow our team, especially in COVID, All right? Thank you. Now, John Maxwell says, leaders evaluate everything on a leadership bias, right? That's what he says. The law of intuition now is based on facts plus instinct and of course, other intangible factors. So facts plus instinct and other intangible factors. And we're gonna see what those intangible factors are as we go along. Now, leaders see everything with a leadership bias. And as a result, they instinctively know what to do. And of course, we can all relate, especially during these times where COVID forced so many businesses to shut their doors physically. And now we have to pivot to virtual. Everything now is virtual. So you have to use that type of leadership instinctiveness to know what steps to take for your business. Now, the great leaders can see things others can't. They make changes and they move forward before others know what's happening. And by that, it just simply means that great leaders are able to, to, to see the vision. They're able to know what moves to make, even though they physically cannot make the moves at this moment. Now, leadership is more of an art than in science. And you're going to see why John Maxwell says this. Thank you. Go to the next slide. All right. Now, when we think about using intuition as leaders and how we can use this to benefit us, now, great leaders... They, they are readers of trends, right? They read the trends. They can look at what happened a few years ago, what's happening now, and they can somewhat predict what might happen in the future in terms of their area of expertise or what they're doing in business. Now, leaders have to read a situation and know instinctively what play to call. Again, COVID taught us that. So many um, businesses that were there for years 21, 30 something years now, they've closed their doors. They're out of business. I drove down the street one day and I saw Pier One going out of business. Now, Pier One, which is the furniture store, awesome, awesome um, products. I saw them going out of business and I thought to myself, hmm, I wonder why they couldn't pivot or transition in this period. What caused them to close their doors? So, of course, you have to be able to, to know what place to call or what place to make. Now, re our leaders are also readers of situation. They can see what's happening in their culture, in their business, in your organization, and they can pretty much decide what steps to take, right? Now, leaders are also, they see the results from who they are. Intuition helps leaders to become readers of the intangible of leadership. Now, intuition will tell the thinking mind, again, the thinking mind where to look next. And that's by Jonas Stahl. Now, when you think about intuition as it relates to leadership, there are three levels. The first one is 
those who naturally see it. And we say these people are the visionaries, you know, the, the Steve Jobs, the big picture people, they see the big picture. And then you have those who are nurtured to see it. So those who are trained, so to speak, those who spend enough time around the Steve Jobs and other people who are the big picture people and they begin to nurture that type of skill set. And then you have those who will never get it. I mean, sad to say, some people just will never get it. And that's okay because you have those who are the visionaries and you have those who are able to chart the course, which, we, which are those who will come alongside them and help them to get to where they are trying to get to, right? Next slide. Now, um, I go one, go one back, um, sorry. Everyone is intuitive in his or own area of natural giftedness. Now, I normally do live video, uh, Facebook lives um, every Wednesday and I talk about leadership strategies and I share pointers or advice and, and stuff like that. Now, when this COVID happened, I was faced with a challenge of, because I don't watch the news. So for those people who get their, their information or is influenced by the news, kudos to you. I stopped watching the news 12 years ago and that's because of personal choice. It was affecting me, so I stopped. So I don't go to the news, but I'm connected to a lot of groups on social media, on WhatsApp, I'm in groups. And when the COVID pandemic hit, I saw so many posts coming at me about the virus and it's spreading and it's affecting people and people are being affected. And, and all of a sudden I begin to feel anxiety. I begin to deal with fear. And I'm normally not that person because I like to be in control of how I feel. I, I believe that I'm able to control my emotions and dictate what day I have based on what I focus on, but I couldn't help being bombarded everywhere I turn. And so anxiety crept in and I begin to pull back. I'm like, okay, no, I have to take control of my mind again. I have to get back to the place where I'm in a state of calm peace and I'm able to function so I begin to practice the things that I normally do I do my meditation I do my prayer you know I take quiet moments and I do the things that help me but while I'm doing that I see people friends family members on, on, on Facebook um, social media coming with the same type of um, feeling they're feeling anxious they're fearful nobody knows what to do what's going to happen their kids all of that and so my instinctiveness now as a speaker and content creator chipped in and I said, instead of doing my regular uh, leadership training on strategies and you know where to go in terms of business and uh, finances, let me switch gears and let me create. So I created a workshop and it was strictly geared towards overcoming fear and anxiety and how to maintain your peace of mind. So you see how your area of giftedness now, that's where intuition comes in. You're most skilled in that area of giftedness. So whatever it is for you, whatever that looks like, that's where you're most intuitive. And that's where you're able to make decisions for your business and for your organization based off that. Right? Next question. Now, the second polling question is, which of these qualities best describes an intuitive leader? Is it they are inspired by inner vision, not external goals? They set the trends, not follow them. They're able to let go of things that are not working. They allow others on the team to contribute. They're able to take multiple courses of action or all of the above. Let me know, which one do you think? Okay. All right. Well, let's see what we got. All right. Woo. So 81% say all of the above. So we have 15% say they're inspired by inner vision, not external goals. They set the trends, not follow them. Nobody clicked that one. Nobody clicked. They're able to let go of things that are not working. So they're able to make multiple courses of action. 4%, but majority of the people went with all of the above. And I would agree. I think all of the above has to come into play at some point as an intuitive leader, because you're going to have to be able to look at the inner vision, look at the picture, the big picture you created. What is it that you're trying to achieve? Where are you trying to go? Where are you trying to get your team to? Then set, then um, set the trends, set the trend. Now we're going virtual. We're all doing Zoom. Who, who would have thought? 
that would all be able to enter or go to a seminar or go to an event mostly now on Zoom, virtual, no more face-to-face, -face, so to speak. And they're able to let go of things that are not working. You have to be able to let go of those things that are not working. That's when it comes into you reflecting on what you're doing as a leader, looking at things that didn't work and don't work. You know, looking at, okay, how can I transition to the next thing? How can I pivot? And they allow others on the team to contribute. As an intuitive leader, you know, you're, you don't have all the answers. You know, even though you may have the vision, you need other people to come alongside you to make the vision work. You know, you need that skill set from somebody else, that perspective. And they're able to take multiple courses of action. They're able to pivot, they're able to turn, transition, change, whatever they need to do. They're able to do it. Now, of course, a lot of intuition, we can go a lot deeper into this, but for the sake of time, we don't have it. If you want a chance to play with me some more, get connect with me some more, you can find me on LinkedIn, Dorica Carter, or on Facebook at Transform Speaker. And these are some questions that I want to leave with you when it comes to thinking about the law of intuition and how you can really apply this to yourself and to your team. These are questions that I want. These are things that I want you to write down in the chat for me and let me know. How is your view of life colored by your top two gifts or talents? Write the answers down in the chat. We're going to be looking at them. And, you know, describe a situation in which leadership intuition affected your organization. All right. I mentioned before that, you know, I had to switch gears and create something that would allow my clients and customers to maintain peace and feel, um, you know, get, get rid of fear so they can function in their business and their um, personal life. So I want you to tell me the same thing. How does it affect your organization or you? And what are you doing to increase your leadership intuition right now? You can answer those in the chat. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys. Okay, well, thank you so much. As we segue over to um, Dr. Wynn, I will let you take it over from here. And then at the end, we can always um, come back and do the chat about leadership intuition. That was excellent. Thank you so much. What a great presentation. Really enjoyed it. Dr. Wynn. Thank you, Jill and Dorika. That was fantastic. I love uh, Dr. Maxwell, uh, great speaker, great author. Um, today, I want to have a little conversation with you about leadership. And I come from this not as someone who considers himself a great leader, but someone who studied leadership for my PhD and who's uh, seeing what works and what doesn't work for regular everyday people. And that's what I consider myself, a regular person, just trying to make a difference in small ways wherever I can. Next, please. So let's start with the polling question. Which quality is most important, do you believe, in a leader? Would it be benevolence, integrity, competence, or maybe something else? Just. Uh, which is most important to you? And are these qualities you think important in a leader? Has everyone had a chance to vote? Oh, okay. That, that's interesting. Um, as you might guess, all these are, are important, but integrity um, is often lacking nowadays, and we wonder where our great leaders are. Thank you. So tonight, I'd like to explore what I think uh, makes uh, a good leader, someone who is followed. Uh, you can't be a great leader without having a lot of people support and follow you. And uh, so one of the things I've identified is trust. Uh, trust is vital for leadership, for all relationships when you're dealing with people. And benevol benevolence is very important. You might have heard before that nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Um, that's actually from former President Teddy Roosevelt. And uh, I think those words uh, ring true 100 years after he spoke them. Um, benevolent benevolence is showing mercy or kindness when you can either help or hurt somebody. If you're a teacher, if someone is between an A and a B and they have an 89, I don't know, maybe maybe an A might be in order. If you're doing someone's performance review and you know they tried really hard, uh, you can say satisfactory or if, if they're above satisfactory, they, they can get that pay raise. Maybe consider approaching it from with, with a heart, with compassion. Um, someone who has a sense of caring. And uh, I like this great, quote from uh, 
a Navy SEAL commander of Navy SEAL Team 3, Jocko Willink, he once said that he learned this from many generals that if you show evidence of caring, uh, if you show the troops the evidence of your caring that they will fight. It's not where, oh, if you order them, if you use your title, if you give them money, gifts, no, you just simply show evidence that you care or, or just simply care, be nice to the people that they will fight and support for you, literally. So, so that I felt so was very valuable. And one, one great example of someone who's benevolent, I find, is Mother Teresa. We all know she volunteered, worked in, in India, helped many poor families and children, sick people uh, get well, saved many, many lives. And uh, I believe now is Saint Mother Teresa. So she's a great example and a, an example that if you're a sports fan, I don't know if you know Nick Saban, very great coach, but some people don't love or respect him because he ha it's been said that he orders people to not look at him in the face when they approach him. Or staff have been ordered to do that. And he's had players who've given their sweat and tears who've been convulsing on the ground and he just walks right over them. And so you can lead short term with uh, fear and intimidation, but long term, I don't think it works very well. Uh, next, please. Um, a next, another important quality as you all voted is integrity. You know, uh, very important for someone to trust and be led is uh, if someone is ethical, honest, they follow the rule that they will treat others as they'd like to be treated. And we don't hear nearly enough nowadays about virtues, classical virtues, cardinal virtues, whether it be prudence, the ability to discern what is right and wrong, wisdom, uh, fortitude, courage in, in the face of, of tremendous difficulty, uh, temperance, restraint, just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should, um, justice, fairness, equity, um, treating people right. And uh, I don't know if people, young people know enough about Nelson Mandela. He was wrongfully imprisoned for many decades and beaten in South Africa. Many years later, he was released and ran for president, became president of South Africa. And he had lunch one day with a, a certain gentleman. And it was, and then later on, President Mandela revealed that, you know, you were a prison, the prison guard who who guarded me for many years and you beat me uh, uh, regularly and but just know that I forgive you and I, I pray for you and so uh, you've got to respect that and follow that so integrity is, is vital um, thank you next slide just a little bit about me um, these are just some of the little nuggets that I have have benefited from um, in my time I, I also I teach at Broward College as an adjunct and I volunteer at my church. Uh, I've taught for 20 years, as Jill mentioned before, and I've been a college administrator for the last 15 years. So one, one example of how I was tested was back in uh, October of 2012, I was the academic chairperson of Miami-Dade College West Campus. And um, I guess there was another chairperson who, who wasn't retained, but uh, I was asked to lead uh, the campus uh, academic operations and one day, uh, after the early morning, we got an announcement that the, the garage that was being built next door had just collapsed and it ended up killing four people and injuring seven others. And a very tough time for all of us. And I, had, I worked with our, our campus leaders in MDC North to, we had to move 200 of our morning classes and 200 of our evening classes uh, to different locations with classes at the same time. Um, back then we didn't have a this virtual, these virtual online stream classes as we do today. So we moved 200 classes to MDC North, 200 classes in the evening to Ronald Reagan High School. And through this period, uh, we didn't miss a single class and all of us, we, we tried to be supportive, give clear guidance to all the faculty. And we ran every single class as scheduled. And at the end, only less than 10 students uh, uh, drop their classes. And uh, many of us to this day remain friends and became closer from that. And uh, it helps to, if you can build trust, you can get a lot of things done in good times and in bad. So, and more recently, I left uh, Broward College as a former associate dean for criminal justice to take a new position. And I'm 
I'm going through, you know, my my tried and true uh, uh, teachings on leadership, and, and they do work. They transfer whether you're you're working, you're coaching soccer or anywhere else. But let me so let me continue with our the, the little nuggets that I've learned. Uh, next, please. The competence. Now, the first two, integrity and benevolence. You know, you can take a lifetime to learn. You know, if you want to acquire those skills, it doesn't take too much time. It just takes takes commitment. This third component of trust is vital and takes the most time, as you can imagine. Um, people trust those who are competent, and you can gain competence through a variety of ways, but you have to be respected. One way is by being a very hard worker. You know, I know our technical staff here, Holiday and, and Harold, you see them working all the time, and, and people respect that. Someone who's willing to roll up their sleeves and, and do the, the less glamorous but hard work um, those who come to work early and stay late, uh, those people are often respected because you know they, 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 uh, they put in the, the blood, sweat, and tears. Um, intelligence is very respected. Um, people who have put in many years doing studies, whether they have certain degrees or not, although there are many highly intelligent people without the degrees, someone with expertise, someone who's done something many times in many ways, uh, someone who's skilled, talented, and as you can see, um, our founder of Microsoft, Bill Gates, I think many people respect him because he's very intelligent. He knows his craft. He knows software. Uh, I imagine he puts in a lot of hours. So can you think of people in your own lives or in public life who, who that you think are really competent and you, you trust their opinion, whether it be your, your accountant, lawyer, doctor, uh, highly competent people? Um, and next, please. Um, so if you put it together, benevolence, integrity, and competence, it stands for BIC, uh, the BIC lighter. So one of my uh, professors at FAU, uh, Dr. John Pasapia, he was a former Washington Redskin and great writer and administrator. He, uh, he talks about uh, these qualities and trust. And uh, I think that JFK put it very well when he said that we're not here to curse but to light a candle. So if you can picture that, remember Vic. Uh, next, please. Okay, polling question four. Do you consider your leadership skills to be emerging, intermediate, or are you maybe a, a natural born leader? Just a good idea to see where we might stand in the audience. And, you know, leadership, some say you can be a born leader, but I really believe that, you know, these skills you can, you can uh, learn through hard work and through through reading and educating yourself. And I really respect everyone who joins these seminars because you want to improve your lives and to, to meet your, your neighbors. Um, do we have results yet? Oh, okay. Yeah, so a lot of folks uh, still working on it and it's a lifelong endeavor. I'm probably consider myself emerging or intermediate too. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we talked about trust, and I think that there are three other ingredients to it that are important to leadership. One is priorities. Um, you've heard in uh, theory about leadership, the goal-centered leadership or people-oriented leadership, which is more important. And in reality, I think both are very important. You have to know your goals, your priorities, and you also have to take care of the people. So priorities are very much like, uh, you've heard the analogy with the, the jar, is it, is it full yet? If you put in your, the rocks, the big important tasks and people might say, oh, it's full. Uh, no, not exactly. You can fill it up some more with pebbles, which are the, the medium or intermediate important tasks. And then some might say, oh, it's full already. And then, but not really, because you can put sand in there. Uh, you can always fill it up. Would you say it's full already with the sand? It's not pictured here, but you can also add water <laughs> and, and fill it up that way. So if you fill up your jar with water, with sand, you'll take care, which, which might be emails and phone calls here or there, uh, playing with your phone. Uh, you can fill it up with uh, the little things, but you might miss some of the big things that you have to get done. So you wanna be aware of what your priorities are and very important in a leader, if you wanna lead for extended periods and not be, uh, uh, not and continue to get your contract, it's important to know the priorities of your organization 
and of your your board, your your supervisor, your your president. Um, what does he or she hold as important? Because you might think, oh, I've got to uh, be have good relations, uh, give perks to people. When if your boss is saying, no, you you need high enrollment and you need to have students uh, graduate and succeed. So you always want to be attuned to what your boss thinks is important. Uh, their top one, two, or three things. You might not get 10 things done, but if you take care of the one, two, or th three things done, then I think that you're going to be effective for a very long time. Now, now most of the time, you're going to want to hear what the boss's priorities are and adhere to them. But there may come a time when you're asked to do something that is possibly illegal or unethical. Um, always give feedback to your supervisor, maybe in private, and, and share your disagreement. And then, you know, I, I've been in a situation where I've been asked to do something illegal, and I politely declined, and then I politely lost my job, and that's okay, um, because you can sleep at night, and uh, I, uh, knowing that you did what, you took care of the priorities that were legal, necessary, and ethical. But, but no one should ask you to do something that is uh, illegal or unethical. Um, about a month after that, I ended up being an employment lawyer. So I was able to go help uh, people fight for their rights. So things always work out in the end. Uh, next, please. OK, and, and this is the, the, another P uh, part of that equation and very important. Uh, you need uh, relational leadership skills. People skills are the glue that hold all of your leadership together because what's the point of leading if you're not taking care of the people and in order to be good at this some people are really natural at this um, i have to say that some people are very good and natural at this i have to work at this what you need to be able to do is listen and get to know people you know really care uh, make deposits of kindness early and often to build goodwill so that if you have a tough situation possibly life or death situation that that you know you've got some goodwill in the bank and that people will work with you. Um, give credit to others, uh, even if they do not deserve the credit, give credit, thanks and cheers. And uh, you know, there's a, there's a thing called the magic five to one relationship ratio, which I borrow from, from marriage counseling. Um, I went to listen to a talk by a great uh, speaker and writer named Dr. Alan Hunt. And after you come away with this, don't please don't repeat that, oh, I heard, Tom was having trouble with his marriage. <laughs> and so we, we listened to his marriage advice talk, but uh, no, the, the five to one uh, ratio is very important because some researchers can tell within five minutes if your relationship or marriage will last. And they look at a couple of different things, how the ratio of positive interactions or communications that you have with your, your loved one versus the negative. So always be uh, saying nice things, uh, doing nice things, um, maybe preparing the coffee for your, your, your spouse in the morning, uh, doing the dishes, uh, whatever their love language might be. I mean, that's another topic, the five love languages. So, so these, this ratio is good in marriages, it's good with friendship, it's good with uh, at work. So positive interactions. And also, of course, be a big cheerleader, you know, you, you want to congratulate people on their birthdays. You want to wish them well if they've experienced something difficult or their, their family members. Um, if, if someone did something wrong, you know, uh, in that they, they, they were reprimanded, you, you, you go privately and, and, and give them, cheer them up, say some nice words. I think that this is a great human interaction, which uh, is the right thing to do. And it helps with leadership because Leadership isn't just a one day thing. You build the leadership days, weeks, months, years in advance, and then you do it thereafter. And, and lastly, um, be polite, the power of being nice. Uh, always ask nicely and say your thank yous. Um, you know, instead of, hey, I need you to do this. How about, um, can you do me a huge favor? Uh, I need some help, can you help me, um, please? Uh, I'm in a jam, can you help me? Uh, people more quickly uh, respond and help you. And I'm, I'm almost wrapping up. I don't want to take up all of Ingrid's time for her great talk coming up next. Uh, next, please. Okay, so last polling question from me. Where will you use your new uh, leadership skills? Will you, can you 
Will you use it at work, home, uh, on an extracurricular activity, part-time or volunteer work? I mean, there's no wrong answer. And please vote if you haven't had the chance. I think we're, we're almost ready for the responses. Yep, all set. Okay. Oh, all right. So work at work is very important, right? And you don't have to be in a position or have a certain title to be a leader. Everybody leads in their own way and people lead lead up, lead down, lead sideways. So so just build trust and you're your leader. And let me continue with my last words. So the last P that's very important I find is positivity, optimism, the quality of being positive. People like to follow those who are optimistic, who are confident, uh, not overly confident, but but, but that calm, uh, people who, who, who exude that they know what they're doing. So, so just remember that, you know, those who, who, you know, when things are tough, have that glasses half full or overly full mentality, people like to follow that. And uh, as you can see, like in elections or in, in interviews for jobs, uh, positive folks tend to do very well, you know, uh, whether Ronald Reagan or Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, regardless of your politics, spoke of a shiny city on a hill that paints a beautiful picture that people want to be a part of. Um, whether it be uh, uh, President Obama who talked about, you know, yes, we can, we can do it. Uh, these positive images, um, people resonate with people and we all know about Helen Keller, who, who was blind for much of her life. She, she once said, keep your face to the sunshine and you'll never see the shadows. So, so please keep that mentality. And lastly, to wrap it up, these, these are our takeaways. Trust, you know, benevolence, integrity, competence, and the three Ps, uh, priorities, people, and, and politeness. If you put these two concepts together, I'm confident that, that you will have many good people who want to support you and help accomplish the mission. So remember in the year 2020, T and P, and it doesn't stand for toilet paper for when we had that, that terrible run. It, it's for trust and the three priorities. Thank you for your time. And uh, I wanna close with a quote from my one of my favorite politicians, um, leaders, Robert Kennedy, who was assassinated. He said, uh, some, some men or women see things as they are and say why I dream things that never were and say why not. So with that positivity and caring for others, um, uh, we're all leaders. Thank you. All right, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Ingrid Jones. I'm a licensed psychotherapist. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking to you about the power of responsibility and integrity. Um, can you move to the next slide, please? All right, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself. As I said before, I'm a licensed psychotherapist and I also teach at Broward College. I'm an adjunct psychology professor and I have spent more than a decade practicing psychotherapy with a focus on empowering people. Now today, we'll be looking at the possible factors that may stop you achieving success in creating the life that you want. So when we talk about leadership, uh, what I want you to think about is that the, the integrity and the responsibility part that we're going to talk about, I want you to consider that those things can be absolutely combining every single aspect of your life, not only at work or at home, but absolutely in everything else. Next slide. All right, so I'm going to start my presentation by asking you a question. Who or what is leading your life? Now, Sometimes we think about uh, things that we do in terms of, well, I guess if I go to work every day, then maybe that's what's leading my life, but not necessarily. So look at the question, look at the answer. Could it be that the approval of your parents or your spouse or your partner or your friend? Are you a people pleaser, for example? Uh, could it be the expectations of others? Uh, could it be the notion of that, how things are supposed to be? We are run by supposed to be's uh, or, could it be that you're trying to prove yourself 
to yourself. I'm dying to actually know your answers to this question. I'm very curious about it because this question comes up often in my practice. So let's see, we should be doing the answers soon. All right, so, oh wow, that's, that's very interesting. So most of you said that you are trying to prove yourself to yourself. So uh, that is actually what's leading your life for the people will be that expectations that others, that others have of you and the notion of how things are supposed to be. I like the fact that no one uh, put like approval of parents or spouse or partners or friends, that's, that's interesting. All right, so now that we have that in place, now that you know exactly what's leading, leading your life, let's look at who are you really? And when I ask this question, a lot of times people answer in terms of what they do instead of who they are. So for example, people will say, I'm a professor, I'm a lawyer, I'm a doctor, I'm a student, right? We sometimes combine those things, but I want you to consider that we are human beings, not human doers. So with that in mind, a lot of we think about leadership as something that we do instead of something that we are or who we can be, right? So when I ask you, who are you really? What comes to mind? Does something that you do come to mind or is it something that uh, you have in terms of being? Uh, could it be that you say, I'm a student? Or is it possible that you say, I'm a happy person, I'm a positive person, I'm a leader? All right, so let's look into that a little further. Next slide, please. All right, so how did you become who you are? Now, all human beings, and I truly believe that in childhood, because our brains are still developing, then we are susceptible to kind of have a, like a shocking effect on things that happen. Now, what I want you to think about for a moment is, think about a moment in your life that you will consider it to be a moment of failure. Yeah, is it, it could be because someone failed, someone failed you, or you fail at something. Take your time, just think about it. You know, one of those memories that we have that they seem to be very real and very much alive in our head. So how do you become who you are? A moment of failure. Perfect. Now that you think about that moment of failure, consider that that moment of failure has kind of dictated who you've become so far. Let me give you an example. Let's say that um, I've heard one, one of the uh, moment of failures that I have heard is uh, someone, she was like five years old and she was in school and she was there sitting at her desk and all of a sudden her teacher just came to her and grabbed her and just put her in another chair. No explanation. Nothing was said, she was just moved to another chair. Well, it turns out once we started digging that she made a decision at that moment without her even knowing. The decision that she made is that there was something wrong with her, that probably she wasn't good enough. And that's why the teacher had moved her. Now, obviously these are all decisions that we make subconsciously, yeah? But once we look at that decision, that moment of failure, we realize that the rest of her life, she has spent it trying to prove that she is good enough because she believed that she wasn't good enough because a teacher moved her from her desk. Now, when you think about your moment of failure, I want you to think about how has that moment of failure dictated the rest of your life? How has that moment of failure determined every single thing you've done in your life, the career that you choose? the relationships that you have, all of those things are part of those moments of failure. Because a lot of times what happens is that we take those moments, we make decisions, and then we continue our lives basing our decisions on that one decision. There's something wrong with me. I'm not good enough. I'm unlovable, whatever it is. So now that we have that clear, next slide. Let me ask you this. In what area of your life is something not working as well as you want? So now that you know, okay, my moment of failure, 
and it's affecting this part of my life because I believe I'm not good enough. So it's affecting, for example, my romantic relationship or your health or your work, your career or your family or your finances. What area of your life is not working as well as you want? And if you feel like a couple of them are the answers, I'm asking you to pick the one that you feel uh, kind of weighs the more, more or has, has kind of a uh, precedent over the other one. Let's see if we got the answer. If you're waiting. All right. So 17% of you said that uh, work and career, something's not working. 29% of you said health. 33% of you said romantic relationship. And 4% said family and friends. And 17% said the finances. Good. So here's the thing. Right now, I'm going to start talking about responsibility. And I'm going to talk about integrity. So as I'm talking about it, I want you to Try to practice and put in perspective of that one thing that you chose as what's not working on your life in your life and how is it that both responsibility and integrity need to be put in place for this aspect of your life to work. Next slide. All right. So responsibility. A lot of times when I talk about responsibility and I ask people, what does it mean to you to be responsible? People see responsibility as a like a chore, as a load right? Something that I have to do, something that I have to carry. Consider that for this conversation, we're going to be talking about responsibility as the creation of the life that you want. So you are going to be the one who is responsible about absolutely every single thing that happens in your life. In other words, um, if you chose that, uh, for example, your health is not working as well as you want, well, Let's take responsibility over it. How is it that we can take responsibility of it? Or if you chose a romantic relationship, let's take responsibility of that. How is it that you are responsible for the romantic relationship? So let me give you an example of what responsibility looks like. Because a lot of times we don't even realize that we have become kind of victims of life. We become victims of things that happen to us uh, or even responsibility itself. So um, there was a moment where I was at my office with a client. It was about nine in the morning. And I decided to open a ginger ale, a can of ginger ale. And I'm about to drink it. And my client looked at me and says, you know, that's bad for you, right? So I said, oh, what, the ginger ale? She said, yeah. And I said, oh, yeah, I know. Like the sugar and stuff. Yeah, I know. It's a lot of sugar. So she looked at me and said, then why are you drinking it? And I said, because I like it. I think it's delicious. I love it, especially in the morning when I get to my office. Anything else? And she looked at me and said, oh, I mean, if you know what you're doing, then no, there's nothing else I can say. See, what's interesting about that story is that I could sit there and say, you know, I try really hard to leave ginger, but I just can't. It's so difficult because I'm addicted to it. The reality is I am not a victim of ginger ale and I will never be a victim of ginger ale. The reality is, I choose to drink ginger ale and I'm responsible about that choice. I'm not going to hide behind the choice of drinking ginger ale. Now, do I know that there's a consequences from that? Yes. One of the consequences that I have is actually that I get people to point out the fact that that's not so good for you. Yeah. And I'm willing and I'm responsible for that consequence, which means when someone points it out, I said, yeah, it's true. Anything else? See, that in itself empowers people. If you were to just take responsibility, ownership for the decisions that you make, and even for those that you don't, you will be amazed of how much power you will have in your life, especially in that area of your life that you chose that is not working so well. Next slide. Integrity. So integrity is one of the most important elements of being a leader. Here's the thing, when we talk about integrity, integrity refers to uh, the capacity of being whole and complete. Now, I'm gonna give a different spin to integrity. So let's think in terms of uh, 
integrity being a matter of your word. Now, did you know that there's a difference between keeping your word and honoring your word? See, when you keep your word, um, you change things according to, um, it, for example, if you say yes to an invitation, but then you get a better invitation, uh, then you get to move this invitation for another day. I mean, you're still keeping your word because you're gonna do it, but just another day. When we talk about honoring your word, now the difference here is you get to be the one that um, does what you said you would in the time that you said you would do it. Now consider how much of your life, how much do you think you will get done? If you were to follow through on everything you said you would do, how far would you be right now if you were to have done every single thing that you said you would in the time that you said you would do it? All of us probably will be much further than we are right now. In fact, all of those, I'm gonna start my diet tomorrow or I'm gonna start going to the gym tomorrow will actually happen because once it comes out of your mouth, if you have integrity, you look forward to honoring your word and following through with what you say. Next slide. Leadership. So here's the thing about leadership and the past and the future. I asked you to look into something in your life that wasn't working. I also asked you to look at something in your life that was a moment of failure. Now consider that we have two filing systems. One is the past and one is the future. Here's the thing. Usually people think about the future in terms of what has happened in the past. So let's say um, I broke up with my boyfriend, with my girlfriend, and you know what? That was really tough. So he broke my heart and he left me feeling that I'm not good enough. So I'm gonna take this piece of I'm not good enough and I'm gonna put it in the file for the future. So get this, your future is exactly like your past because you're not willing and you're not able to just leave your past in your past. You're actually taking yourself and all the stuff that has happened into your future with you. So you're not able to create a different future. So I want you to consider in terms of leadership, how about be the leader of your life? So how about you declare a new future for yourself? How about you empty that drawer that you have for the future completely? And you start a future from the future of what you want to achieve as opposed to what didn't work or what hasn't worked. So when we look at it, my relationships are not working. My work is not working. My health is not working. My finances are not working. Okay, they weren't working. So now, if you were to be responsible about your choices, and if you were to have integrity about your choices, what would your future look like now based on leadership? Next slide. Last but not least, I consider my life and life in itself to be a game. To be a game. I usually tell people I play for a living, I don't work for a living because this is kind of my playground and I love doing what I do. Now, when we consider life to be a game, then there's so many opportunities that open up for you. That includes living your past in the past, creating it in the future, it includes being responsible and choosing what to do and what to be. Remember, you're not a human doer, you're a human being. And last, have integrity. In other words, honor your word. Don't keep it, honor it, follow through. And get this, if you're not gonna follow through, please don't say it. Start looking into that and you'll see how much it change. Will change your life will change just based on that. Next slide. So I, I actually, when I was doing this, uh, this slide, uh, I came up with this quote where uh, I said, without responsibility, there's no integrity. So you have to be responsible for the stuff that you do, right? Own your life. Um, but if you don't have that responsibility, how can you have integrity and be whole and complete? And now if you don't have integrity, if you're not whole and complete, if you don't follow your word, you have no power. And if you don't have no power, how can you be a leader? Consider that if you want to be a leader outside in the world, well, you need to start with leading your life first. And together combining with uh, all the, all the uh, stuff that we learned today from the other two panelists. I think you have a lot of powerful stuff to go by and to apply in your life in order to start creating the new life that you want and start playing a different game. Thank you for coming. Um, thank you for uh, listening today. And um, I think that's it. <laughs>
Well, I want to thank you, of course, all three of you. I think the word of the day was integrity. We talked about intuition. There's so many things that are wonderful aspects of leadership. And, and the good news is everyone can be a leader in a certain situation. It's just honing your skills. We could be born with them or we certainly can learn them. And, and that's, I think, what was important about you spending the time today with our alumni and friends and part of the foundation, everyone that joined in on the call, just being able to share thoughts and support each other because that's how we all thrive is by feeling great about what we've accomplished. And we do that by working with each other. So that being said, I did wanna give a nice commercial for our next webinar, um, because this will be uh, the next one in our series. And because of the holiday season and giving, we thought we would share the secret to living is giving and how you get more from giving back, which I think all three of you touched upon. Uh, in being a leader, how you need to uh, give back in order to thrive. So we will have seven panelists on. Uh, Nancy, who is our vice president of the foundation, will be leading us off, as well as Jeremiah Carter, who's an alum. Tamara Chase is an alum. Uh, Brenda, Reginald, Tanya, and Millie, who's a student. So we'll be getting more information out to you about that as well when we send out the recording for you. Uh, so <clears throat> we don't like to keep you much past uh, six. Uh, if anybody did have any quick questions or thoughts, um, why don't we use the chat instead of the Q&A and feel free if um, I know that uh, our panelists can see it. If anybody has anything quick, if not, it's about 5.58. So we probably will let you go. And uh, we will also give you the contact information. We mentioned that all three of them do have ability to communicate with you and wanna help and support you. And we, again, thank you so much for your dedication to Broward College and also all of our people that signed on. I can see your names, Adriana, Alicia, Barbara, Bill, Carla, Christina, Donna, Erica, Hans, Isis, Jean, Gene O'Brien, Jean Griffith, Jeanette, Candace, Kimberly, Kristen, Lana, Dr. Elsinger, um, Sanders, uh, Marilyn, Michelle, Morgan, the list goes on, Nancy, Paul, Ralph, Scott, Shireen. Thank you all so much. And again, Professor Jones, Dr. Wynn, and Dorica, thank you again for, for all of your help and for being here today. So thank you very much. All right, if no one has anything else, I'll be ending the show in three, two,